Good afternoon. My name is Adrian and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the State of 911 webinar series. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Brian Givens, you may begin your conference. Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the State of 911 webinar series presented by the National 911 Program. My name is Brian Given, and I am support for the program. This webinar series was designed to offer 911 stakeholders information about ongoing federal and state 911 and NG911 projects and provide real experiences and best practices from early adopters about NG911 transition processes currently underway across the country. Um, like I said before, this is the second installment of our bi-monthly series. Each webinar consists of a presentation from a federal level and a state level 911 stakeholder, um, with presentations followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Um, at the end of the event, if there's time, we will open up, um, open up the floor to, to more questions. Following today's event, a recording of this presentation, along with the slides, will be posted to the National 911 Program website at www.911.gov. You can go there to find information on past and future events as well, and just to learn more about the National 911 Program. Um, if you go there today, you might find that there's some technical difficulty going on, but we should have everything smoothed out by the end of the week. We'll begin today's event with a presentation from Mr. David Firth from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau of the FCC, presenting on the FCC's NG911 update. Following a Q&A with Mr. Firth, Mr. Barry Ritter, the Executive Director of the Indiana Wireless 911 Board, and Mr. Mark Grady, founder of InDigital, will be presenting on Indiana's 911 program. Um, and here is Lori Flaherty from the National 911 program to give an introduction of Mr. Firth. Thanks, Brian. And uh, good day, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited uh, to have both uh, folks from the FCC and folks from Indiana participating in our webinar series. Um, it's my job to introduce Mr. Firth, and it is my pleasure. Um, David is the Deputy Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission, um, and I will tell you he, he and his staff have been exceptional partners for the National 911 Program. Their commitment extends way beyond their responsibility uh, for 911, and it has been a real joy to work with them on issues at the federal level. Uh, I, uh, David is going to be speaking about a number of things related to their activities uh, on behalf of all of us. So without further ado, Mr. Firth. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you for that very nice introduction, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to walk very quickly through a slide presentation so that, uh, with, with luck, we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, why don't we just jump right in and go to the first slide, if we could? Thank you. So um, before before launching into a little bit of an update on Next Generation 911 uh, 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 and the FCC's role, a bit of background to help explain where the FCC fits into the regulatory picture, because the 911 system is a very complicated architecture, and it has multiple layers of governance, and the FCC has a role, as does uh, at, at the federal level, DOT and NHTSA, uh, and also there is obviously an extremely important, really the critical role, um, that is played uh, by 911 authorities and PSAPs at the state and local and tribal level. So this, in very simplified terms, illustrates a little bit of that jurisdictional b breakdown by illustrating a, a an incident, uh, which is the picture on the left, an emergency that occurs somewhere that generates uh, a 911 call, which is the next picture, working your way across the slide to the right. Um, and uh, when 911 calls are placed, they're typically placed over commercial networks, which might be wireless or wireline uh, or VOIP. Uh, and it's the FCC that has the primary regulatory responsibility for the commercial providers that support the, the, that portion of the 911 architecture. So the, the, the call that comes in from a member of the public needing assistance is typically a call placed over an FCC-regulated carrier. Then that call is 
transmitted to a public safety answering point, a PSAP, and the FCC has, has no jurisdiction over PSAPs, and in fact the federal government um, does not have jurisdiction over PSAPs. PSAPs are, are, are administered, governed, uh, and largely funded at the state, local, and tribal level. Um, the, the DOT NHTSA National 911 Office that is the sponsor of this webinar uh, has a very active role in working um, with PSAPs and their governing authorities and providing assistance in a variety of ways. Um, but the responsibility is essentially one that, that is at the non-federal level. And then the call to the PSAP will result in the dispatch of first responders. And first responders also typically are our state, local, and tribal authorities. Only in unusual situations would they be federal authorities. Uh, and But the FCC actually has a regulatory role here as well because to the extent that those first responders, and they all, all do use radio systems for dispatch and communication, um, those systems are licensed by the FCC. So we're not going to dwell on that piece of it. We're going to be primarily focusing on 911. But it's helpful to understand where the commission fits in and where other regulatory authorities and different levels of government fit into the, to the larger picture. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is just a very high level uh, description of, of next generation 911. Uh, and some of the differences between next generation 911 and legacy 911. The legacy system has been with us for now a number of decades, and, and various improvements have been made to the uh, to the legacy system over that time. Um, but next generation 911 is really transformational because what it involves is taking the legacy system, which is primarily a circuit switched voice based system that operates through the existing switch telephone network, and moving it to uh, a series of IP platforms, and uh, that will offer a number of advantages over legacy 911 as NG 911 is implemented. It uh, provides advantages in terms of network architecture. It provides vastly improved access to the public, and particularly to people with disabilities, people with hearing impairments or speech impairments. Uh, it also has the potential to leverage commercially available IP-based technologies that are being widely used for many purposes in the commercial world. And so over time, the next generation 911 uh, architecture is going to fully replace legacy 911, but that's a transition that's going to take time. It is not going to be uniform. It is going to vary from state to state and in some instances from locality to locality as to how that, uh, uh, that transition takes place. Let's go to the next slide. So this is just a very highly oversimplified uh, illustration of the legacy architecture. Um, the 911 system really started originally as a wireline system where wireline phone calls would be uh, sent into the switch telephone network and then carried typically by the ILEC on a selective router to the correct PSAP and uh, then handled from there. Uh, over time, the legacy architecture had added to it the capability to deliver wireless calls and also VoIP calls. Um, and those uh, may originate from different points and travel over different networks, but ultimately in the legacy architecture, everything is still sent through that uh, traditional selective router in the public switch network. So let's go to the next slide. And this, again, a highly oversimplified picture is the uh, a, a vision of the, the end state of next generation 911 architecture. So you still see the PSDN in there uh, on the left side, but you see a number of other uh, ways of transmitting 911 calls. Uh, they can come, first of all, from a wider array of, of devices. They can still come from a traditional wireline phone, a wireless phone, uh, or a VoIP phone, but they may also come over smartphones. They may come over fixed broadband. All of these are, are, are potential ways of delivering 911 traffic. And they may be delivered, instead of being delivered through the circuit switch network, they're going to be delivered over a variety of networks uh, via the internet using IP technology and then into uh, an emergency services uh, network that's operated by the 911 authority, which is also IP-based. And there are uh, some 
um, some areas of the country where ESINETs are already being being developed. There are others where they are on the drawing board, and there are others where this is still uh, probably some time in the future. But ultimately, the vision of fully realized next generation 911 is that that all 911 traffic will be delivered um, over the this much richer variety of platforms, and it will also allow for the delivery of many more types of traffic. So in addition to voice, it could support text, it could support video and data. Data and, and provide a great deal more inf information to the peace apps. The trick is how you get from the transition from the last slide to this slide, and that there is a lot, obviously, that is um, sort of omitted in, in simply doing this transition in terms of how uh, both on the carrier side, on the, on the commercial side, and also on the peace app side, this transition takes place. So let's go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> The FCC uh, has been traditionally, as I mentioned before, involved in regulation of 911, uh, principally on the carrier side. And uh, in August of 2011, uh, the chairman of the FCC announced a five-step plan for trying to facilitate and, and expedite the transition from legacy 911 to next generation 911. And this five-step plan involves a number of different elements, some of which are things that the FCC committed to do and is, is doing, but also others which involve really partnerships with the wide variety of 911 stakeholders. These are not things that uh, the commission or really any stakeholder can do unilaterally. They are, they are things that require partnerships. And I'm going to talk specifically in a little more detail about a couple of the the most recent developments in the um, the, the 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 actual implementation of this plan. But before I do, I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of of of, of how that plan frames both the FCC's role and our vision of of, of the partnership going forward. So one element of the plan um, was to develop location accuracy mechanisms for next generation 911. The Commission has long been involved in the phase one, phase two E911 process for adding location accuracy to the existing 911 system, particularly when uh, 911 calls are placed from wireless phones. And what we want to be sure of is that as the transition is made to next generation 911, that the ability to automatically locate a 911 caller is carried over from the legacy system to the next generation system, and that in fact we can continue to make improvements and refinements to it so we get better accuracy than we've had with the legacy system. And there are a number of challenges associated with, with location accuracy in a next generation world, partly because of the larger variety of, of originating devices and platforms that 911 calls may come in from, uh, and also because we are increasingly dealing with, with challenges challenges that really weren't part of the, the, the E911 world when it started. Um, when we started E911 more than a decade ago, the, the focus, <coughs> excuse me, the focus was primarily on outdoor location because wireless technology was largely used and it was anticipated that it would be used uh, to make calls from outdoors, from highways, uh, from scenes of accidents. Um, so the existing infrastructure and the rules that, that were, were uh, adopted to go with that infrastructure really focused on outdoor location. And what we're seeing is there's an enormous trend towards more and more 911 calls being delivered over wireless, even if they are coming from indoors. And so there's been a great, much greater focus on indoor location. And our CISRIC, which is our Communications uh, Security Reliability and Interoperability Committee, uh, which is a um, uh, which is a, an advisory committee to the commission, is um, has been working on indoor location. Uh, they have uh, created a test bed to do indoor location. And uh, the indoor location uh, report that they are going to be submitting to us in March um, will then provide the basis for more work on indoor location and hopefully on developing uh, standards and potentially rules that will, will help to make um, indoor location a, a part of the overall location fabric. So that's the first point in the plan. The next one, which I'll come back to, is um, enabling consumers to send text and photos and videos. 
uh, over next generation enabled networks. And that's something where there's some recent developments I'll come back to with respect to text to 911. Uh, the third is the development of a next generation 911 funding model. That, that is an ongoing process. Funding is a challenge at all levels of government. Uh, one of the things that the commission has worked on is uh, annually issuing reports um, that Congress requires us to submit on both the collection and the use of 911 fees, and the Commission issued its most recent annual report uh, just a few weeks ago, and that's available on our website. Uh, the fourth point in the uh, five-point plan is standards uh, and uh, facilitating the completion and the implementation of next generation 911 technical standards. The, the work of creating those standards has largely been going on outside of the FCC. The FCC is not a standards body itself. Uh, and an enormous amount of terrific work has been done to develop the standards that will provide the basis for next generation 911. So our focus is more on making sure that as we move forward with our regulatory activities that we take those standards into account and we encourage uh, the use of those standards uh, as much as possible across the country. And then the last part of the uh, five-point plan is governance. Uh, and this is also inherently a, a partnership uh, exercise where we have to work with all of the different governing authorities that uh, have authority over pieces of the 911 system and uh, to, to develop a next generation 911 governance framework. And I'll talk for a minute about the report that we're going to be submitting to Congress in about a month that will make some recommendations that relate to governance. So let's go to the next slide if we could. Let me talk for a few minutes about our text to 911 further notice of proposed rulemaking. This was a, a further notice of proposed rulemaking in a rulemaking proceeding that we actually started in 2011, where we were looking at uh, the potential for next generation 911 to support the delivery of text, video, uh, and, and other uh, uh, media besides voice uh, over 911 networks. And in an original notice that we put out in September and then in this further notice that we put out just this past uh, December, we've focused in particular on text to 911. And uh, this has been in parallel with some very important and very positive developments in the commercial marketplace to move forward with the implementation of text to 911. So uh, in December of 2012, the commission made a, a two-part proposal. And this, this slide illustrates uh, the first part of it, um, which is, um, just go to my notes here for one second. Um, the proposal is that we would require all wireless carriers and what we call interconnected text providers. And, and those are providers of text applications, typically over uh, mobile broadband networks that are used by smartphone users. And these would be text applications that support texting to any phone number. Uh, so it's not necessarily text applications within closed, uh, uh, closed networks, like, for example, Facebook texting or something like that. But there are interconnected text providers that support texting to any phone number. And the wireless carriers all support SMS, uh, which, which is also a uh, text capability to any phone number. And the proposal is that uh, by a date certain, um, all wireless carriers and interconnected text providers must enable consumers to send text messages to 911 in areas where PSAPs are prepared to receive the texts. So we are proposing to impose an obligation on carriers. We are not proposing to, uh, propose to impose an obligation on PSAPs. We don't have jurisdiction over them, and it's going to be up to the PSAPs to decide at what point they are prepared to receive text messages. But we want to have the carriers uh, in a position to be able to deliver text because we think that that will uh, really spur the momentum in terms of moving to a next generation environment. Um, in conjunction with the notice that the commission adopted, the four major wireless carriers, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint, made a voluntary commitment uh, based on negotiations with APCO and NINA to implement text to 911 capability in their networks by May 15th of 2014. So what the further notice proposes is to, to apply this, essentially to codify this and to apply the same or a similar time frame to all providers. Now this is a proposal. The Commission has not yet adopted a rule. What we have done is to put the proposal out for comment. 
and comments on the further notice are due in early March and replies are due in April. And then based on the record that we receive, the commission will move later in the year towards an order. Um, so it could adopt the proposal in its entirety. It could adopt some elements of the proposal and change others. That's, that remains to be seen and that will be dependent on the record. Let me go to the next slide. This is the other element of the, the December further notice, and this relates to what we call the, the, bounce, the bounce back message. One of the, the, the biggest concerns that we have and that, that, that many in the 911 community have is that as this transition takes place, because it's not going to be uniform, because it's going to happen in different places at different times, there is a, a danger that consumer expectations will not match up with the reality of what's available. And in fact, when you talk about text, there, there's already uh, a, a, a significant segment of the population that may be under the misimpression that text to 911 already exists, when in fact it does not. So what the commission focused on was the importance of ensuring that even in situations where text to 911 does not exist, that if someone attempts to send a text message to 911, to a PSAP, and that uh, text to 911 is not supported uh, in that area, that the, that person needs to receive an automated message immediately saying text to 911 is not available. Many of the carriers already do this. Um, it varies from carrier to carrier, and the nature of the message may vary. But our concern was that as text to 911 is deployed in more and more jurisdictions with more and more carriers, expectations <coughs> are going to change, and it is going to be difficult for consumers always to keep track of where it is and is not available, which is why it's very important to have any situation where it's not available uh, where the consumer gets, gets a message back saying it's not, so that they're not under the false impression that a text to 911 has gone through. And again, the further notice proposal is based on a commitment that the four major carriers made, um, again, with, in negotiation with APCO and NINA, to implement bounce back capability in their networks by June 30th of this year. So this capability will be implemented well before text to 911 is, is implemented. And in the further notice, we propose to, to apply the same or a similar time frame uh, to all providers, uh, carriers, wireless carriers, and interconnected text providers. And because we're looking at a, a, a deadline that is considerably sooner, we put this issue on a, an accelerated comment cycle. So comments are due uh, in a few days, really next week on January 29th, and replies will be due on February 8th. And it's our expectation the Commission will tackle this issue then before, uh, before June. Let's go to the next slide. Lastly, I just want to touch on uh, one other uh, important task that the Commission's undertaking right now with re respect to governance. Last February, the, the Congress passed uh, a piece of legislation that had a number of public safety provisions, including what is called the Next Generation 911 Advancement Act of 2012. And in that portion of the act, uh, the FCC was directed to submit a report to Congress on recommendations for the legal and statutory framework for Next Generation 911 services. That report is due in February, on February 22nd, which is the one-year anniversary of the act. And the Commission has already sought comment on what recommendations should be included and has received very good comments from a wide variety of 911 stakeholders. So let's go to the next slide. The, the topics that will be in the report are the topics that Congress uh, specified in the statute. And what this, this slide summarizes is the issues on which Congress sought recommendations from the Commission uh, and also asked the Commission to coordinate with, uh, uh, with NHTSA, with the 911 office, uh, and with DHS as well. So uh, the report will look at the overall legal and regulatory framework for the transition from legacy 911 to next generation 911. Um, it will look at legal mechanisms to ensure efficient and accurate transmission of caller information to emergency response agencies. And it will look at removing jurisdictional barriers and inconsistent regulations, including uh, both federal and state regulations. Um, Congress explicitly recognized the existing state authority over 911 services and uh, is not seeking to supplant that authority, but wants to look at ways to uh, encourage states or even require states to remove 
regulatory roadblocks to next generation 911, which could be created by regulations that were designed for legacy 911. Uh, also has asked us to look at eliminating outdated federal regulations and potentially at preempting inconsistent state regulations. So we are working on the report based on the comments that we have received. Ultimately, these what will be in the report will be recommendations. They will not. There will be nothing binding in the report. It is entirely up to Congress to decide what they want to do with those recommendations. But we will be uh, providing that report in a few weeks. And with that, uh, I, hopefully, there's a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, I apologize because I'm going to have to drop off at at 12:30 for another uh, another obligation. But uh, uh, if there, I'll, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. And if uh, there are follow-up questions, I'll try to do it after the webinar. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press the star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Jerry Eisner. Your line is now open. Hi, David. Good morning. Um, is there any correlation between NextGen 911 and the activities of FirstNet? Yes, actually there is, and, and, and that's an important issue. Um, we want to be sure that as FirstNet uh, develops standards for the public safety broadband network uh, and initiates uh, its process, um, that we are, are looking at technical issues to make sure that communications that are generated over next generation 911 um, that could potentially then result in information being used by FirstNet users, um, that there's technical com compatibility so that you can have end-to-end -end connectivity and that, that data or video or, or other information that's generated through next generation 911 can be used by um, the public safety first responders that are using FirstNet. So that's actually an issue that we have uh, explicitly sought comment on in both proceedings involving FirstNet and in proceedings involving Next Generation 911. So it's, it's an important point and one that we are very focused on. There are no further questions. I'll turn the call back over to the presenters. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank um, you. If, if there are any more questions later on, uh, would it be just best to have them email you, David, or? Uh, um, if uh, wh whatever is the, is most efficient, if um, I think my recommendation would probably be that they email them to you through the whatever mechanisms you have set up, and then you can you can forward them to me. Um, that would probably, but but um, uh, you know, but I, I, my email is david.firth at fcc.gov. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me directly, uh, they're welcome to do that as well. Great. Thank, thanks again, David. All right. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Lori to introduce uh, Mr. Ritter and Mr. Grady. Thanks, Brian. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, we our, our goal was to share information about what's going on at the federal level, and also, you know, to share information from folks who have implemented components of the NG911 model. And Indiana is certainly one of those early adopters. Uh, Mr. Barry Ritter is the executive director of Indiana's Wireless 911 Board, and Mr. Mark Grady is the founder of Indigital. Um, they've both been key in terms of moving Indiana's network forward, and they are here to tell you about that. So without further ado, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lori, and this is Barry Ritter, executive director of the statewide 911 Board. Indiana appreciates the opportunity to highlight uh, the work of uh, wireless 911 and the network in our state. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we will briefly go through this uh, presentation and then try to answer any questions that you might have. Indiana approached wireless 911 in a progressive, forward thinking manner. Uh, in the early stages and approached wireless 911 as a statewide initiative and not segregated by county jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, we'll look at the consolidation requirements that Indiana PSAPs are facing today and how that has impacted uh, the work towards uh, the next generation 911 uh, services. We'll look at uh, the changes in our funding mechanism and how funding is 
provided to local counties for operation of their PSAPs as well as uh, operating the statewide uh, EZI net uh, that we enjoy here in Indiana. The status of our next gen initiatives and then a feature that our vendor in digital telecom has um, been working on a soft rollout in the uh, texting platform here in Indiana. Next slide, please. The E911 in the wireless industry initiative started in 1996. Um, my predecessor, Ken Loudon, and state legislators and other stakeholders um, came together to uh, do a statewide initiative. That entity has uh, now transitioned uh, with changes in state law that we are no longer responsible strictly for wireless 911 in Indiana, but we have the responsibility for all 911 services. That state level board consists of a 13 members, and the membership on that board uh, was very key in that the industry has stakeholders at the table as well as local and state government uh, to include uh, the PSAPs as we move forward. That board is chaired by our state treasurer, uh, Richard Murdoch, and the state treasurer serves as chair because one of our primary functions is to collect 911 fees from the communication service providers and then remit those fees back to county government for the operation of the PSAPs. Next slide, please. All eligible 911 expense categories are set out in state law. Indiana has a very liberal list of eligible expenses uh, for 911 funds that are given to uh, county government. The uh, funds are audited on the government side uh, at the state level within our office and the treasurer's office, as well as every expenditure that the county makes for PSAP operations is audited by the State Board of Accounts to ensure that 911 funds are used appropriately and legally and to be able to track the um, collection and use of the 911 fee to ensure that it's adequate for PSAP operations in Indiana. Next slide, please. In 2008, there was a legislative mandate uh, to consolidate uh, to no more than two PSAPs in each of the 92 counties. Uh, Indiana um, experienced in rural counties multiple PSAPs. Uh, that was a duplication of services and counties have been working to move towards the uh, deadline, December 31st of 2014, for consolidation within the counties. Um, we are now seeing counties um, cross the county borders and begin to discuss consolidation of those PSAPs um, in multiple counties. And in an attempt to not be legislated from the state's perspective for uh, future consolidation. Right now we, we have anywhere from five to seven counties still facing consolidation and um, they are in varying stages of that process. Next slide, please. Um, these are just five of the counties that are still facing consolidation uh, on this map indicated in, in yellow. Um, I will call your attention to the Lake Region, Lake County up in the northwest corner of the state of Indiana, they are attempting to consolidate 18 PSAPs uh, into one PSAP and they are of varying sizes, uh, Gary, Indiana uh, down to a one position PSAP that may serve four city square blocks. And um, the um, technology uh, issues that they're facing beyond 911 are some of the obstacles that they are encountering. Next slide, please. In July of 2012, Indiana law changed the funding structure for 911 services uh, from being set at county to being a single fee collected at the state. Uh, today, all landline, wireless, and VoIP uh, providers uh, collect um, 90 cents per subscriber and remit that back to our office. And prepaid is handled differently. It is 50 cents per transaction handled at the point of sale 
remitted to the Indiana Department of Revenue. At the time this legislation changed and the funding uh, was not being sent to county government but would be sent to the state of Indiana, the uh, assurance to local government uh, was set as a whole harmless level of funding, uh, that being a guarantee to each of the uh, county governments that they would receive uh, no less than a three-year average of their 911 revenue. The um, counties uh, then have the opportunity to receive uh, a percentage of any new revenue that's collected at the state beyond that hold harmless level of funding. The funding that we provide allows local government through those eligible expenses to pay for PSAP operations up through the uh, communication specialist headset and then with some exceptions uh, local government can use 911 funding for radio expenses, uh, some elements within CAD, and to fund their operations, personnel, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. And I'm Mark Grady, and I'll explain that as we try to modernize Indiana's 911 statute, one of the challenges we ran into is that there's not really a clear definition of what NG911 is today, and that's really true on many levels. Um, for our legislative effort last year in the session, uh, we, Indiana, really just treats NG911 as the functional equivalent or successor to legacy 911. That kept us quite a bit out of the weeds of uh, trying to rewrite some of the components of the act that had been in place since 96 and uh, avoided the complexity of trying to define exactly what NG is. And as you saw in David's presentation, the transition from old to new is a challenging uh, challenging task. Next slide, please. We actually started that process in 2006 with a statewide network that uh, served at the time 13 wireless carriers and 167 PSAPs. Uh, today it still continues to serve all the wireless carriers, all VoIP providers, and is uh, connected to all wireline and all 911 system service providers. 911 system service provisioning is a competitive service in Indiana with services provided by AT&T, Frontier, and CenturyLink, and others. Um, the ESI net, the, the in digital built for the state board, provides uh, access to NCIC uh, for criminal information, automatic fingerprint enrollment systems, and a number of other high availability services. For some of the rural counties, this was their opportunity to have the same type of service that a larger county, a metropolitan area county, might have. So we have a very uniform level of service now throughout the entire state. Next slide, please. This map kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for that. Um, each one of these dots, the colored dots that's on there, is an agency, a PSAP agency. As Barry said, by uh, 2014, the goal is to get that down to uh, one dot per county, and many of them are already there today. There is an exception in the uh, statute that allows for uh, two agencies within a county as a backup. It's not really defined, it just will allow a second one to exist. It could be a land-grant college or an airport in some cases as well. Next slide, please. So the status of our work so far has to been has been to construct the CSINet platform. We've processed over 15 million calls today using VoIP technologies and other NG concepts. I put a URL, a, a web address in the map, or that you can see a map of the calls in real time. It does require flash, so it won't work on an iPad or an iPhone. But from your laptop computer, you can take a look at live calls as they arrive in the network and they're processed. Uh, we continuously work to improve the network and introduce new services, and I'll give you one example of that on the next slide, please. Currently, we have about 19 counties that are using a text service platform. We call it Texty. Um, it does have a TTY component that will be significantly enhancing in the next couple of months to ensure access to all agencies, but it provides non-voice service from the PSAP to the public. So the reverse of what David talked about in his presentation uh, and the initiatives that are at the FCC and within the industry, uh, these non-voice dialogues are initiated by the call taker and they use their own local protocol, although training keeps that fairly consistent throughout the state. But these dialogues then use SMS as the transport medium from the call taking agency to the public and they're identical to any other texting that's done by the public. Uh, the Texty platform is a high feature platform that is, it allows conversations longer than 160 characters from the public to the agency. From the agency out, the 160 character limit of SMS is enforced to ensure compatibility with all handsets. 
and we're working closely with TCS for inbound text, which we hope to launch later this year. The next slide, please. This shows you how we've done the deployment fairly quickly. Uh, TextE is a service platform that runs in a browser. Uh, many, many of the uh, early systems, I think, are going to use this adoption method. So this is just a regular Google Chrome browser that has software that runs within that shell and allows the call taker to uh, open and start a dialogue with the public. Uh, that can be a, a result of a number of different things, and we'll talk about those in a second. We've, I've shown in this particular example uh, uh, an image. Uh, the system is capable and will be enhanced to include multimedia messaging uh, in the future, although multimedia does uh, slow down the call processing time. We find uh, standard SMS texts take about six seconds in transit. So it's, it's certainly suitable for public safety. Next slide, please. How this is being used today, really predominantly the PSAPs are using it for silent or abandoned calls. Uh, frequently a user may inadvertently dial, of the public may inadvertently dial 911 and when the PSAP calls the public member back, they won't take it because they don't recognize the number. Uh, what we've found is that when they text them back, they'll almost always respond to a text message. They're also used extensively for administrative follow-up, providing incident numbers or detective for follow-up information. Uh, it's been very useful in domestic incidents where one or more of the partners can't talk while the other one's in the room. And it's been very successful in runaway and possible missing incidents where the public authority can uh, take action to uh, bring about a rendezvous with Child Protective Services or with a deputy or other law enforcement officer for a possible missing or runaway child. Um, it's also been helpful for to convey uh, detailed instructions by phone, phone numbers, uh, poison control information. Um, there's been a lot of uses. With 19 counties, we've had several thousand of these types of calls that have done uh, that have went, taken place since we launched the service in January of last year, and it's been a, a very, uh, very well received uh, platform and a very good program. And that really concludes our presentation. We're anxious for questions. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Michael Vest. Your line is now open. Yeah, I'm just curious how you get the uh, addressing through SMS. I'm not familiar with it, but I, like with the cell phone, you'll get it through the cell carrier. How, how are you obtaining the caller's or the texter's location? The, the platform today is used after a phase two call has been received by the agency. As I said, this is from the public safety agency to the public. So most of the time there's been a phase two call that's been received by the agency that gives the location information. Under the integration work we'll be doing with TCS as part of the initiative that the industry has voluntarily agreed to, uh, location-based services are queried to provide that location information to the call taker. Your next question comes from the line of Pete Kirby. Your line is now open. Hi, fellas. I want to ask you uh, how this system interfaces with uh, existing provisions in 911 centers for uh, the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, does, it, does this form a, an addition to or does it work seamlessly with existing ADA compliance systems? A little of each. Um, under the current arrangement, it's in addition to where the agency is using a browser-based interface. In the next month or so, we're going to be rolling out a TTY component of that for agencies where deploying a browser-based platform isn't feasible due to local practice or, or equipment limitations. And in that case, it will be a direct extension of SMS to TTY. Your next question comes from the line of a participant who did not leave their information. Please state your name and ask your question. I think the answer to that question is we're working on that issue under development. Your next question comes from the line of Curtis Sutton. Your line is now open. That was me on the last uh, question. Sorry. Very good. Your next question comes from the line of Jeff Cohen. Your line is now open. Thanks. Uh, one question. Uh, what happens when, uh, in a roaming situation, uh, when a when a caller is 
roaming on a different carrier's network. For non-voice service, um, the subscriber needs to have a subscription to some type of SMS messaging platform, or they need to have an equivalent 10-digit number that can be used to initiate text to a non-traditional device in some examples. So uh, typically where we're seeing these calls arrive at the agency from a phase two, it could, for example, come from a non-service initialized phone. In those situations, uh, text back to the caller is not possible. Your next question comes from the line of Kevin Rose. Your line is now open. I actually have my question answered. Thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of Patrick Goldschmidt. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, on the consolidation part, I know it was downward directed from the state with legislation, but how did you deal with pushback, for example, in a county that may had three or four when you got a police chief or a sheriff that doesn't want to give up his control of a dispatch center? How did you guys deal with that? The legislature uh, dealt with that um, in that if a um, county fails to consolidate within the requirements of the statute, they will forfeit any distribution of their 911 revenue. Your next question comes from the line of David Connor. Your line is now open. Thank you. How um, or what efforts have you made with public awareness to get everyone on the same page with where they can text at and where they cannot, I guess specifically in the counties where text is not available at currently? Well, because we've been doing text from 911 rather than to 911, uh, the public education burden has been much less. Um, what we have found, surprisingly, is that the public is not as shocked that 911 can text them as those of us on this call would be. Um, they're used to getting text messages to pick up their uh, orders at Walmart and uh, to confirm their uh, uh, flight uh, departure times and all manner of other things. So I think we've only had a couple of cases in the several thousand calls that have went through that where agencies have reported that the public was surprised that they got a text message from 911. Now, as we start to roll out the inbound service later this year, we'll have a, a significantly more uh, public education will have to be made there. And again, as David Firth uh, indicated in his presentation, uh, having the right bounce back messages, the right system messages that guide the public goes a long ways toward minimizing some of the burden of public education. Your next question comes from the line of Becky Berger. Your line is now open. Do I understand on your map where you're consolidating not only your PSAPs, but you've also, in Indiana, um, consolidated the wireline and wireless 911 calls? I'll answer that. I thought Barry was going to jump in there. Yes, um, for those counties that have done consolidation, it has been for all tr all call types. Uh, typically, the most of the counties only had one center uh, before the statute was passed in 2008, and and going forward from that time, they've typically consolidated then into one unified center, and it does receive all call types. Yes. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brenda Edmondson. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is for um, Mr. Firth, if he's still on the line, regarding uh, the um, notice of propo proposed rulemaking and the um, comments that are due um, for the bounce back messages, um, the accelerated comments due January 29th. So it's, and, and I may be wrong about this, and this is where I wanted the clarification. I understand the. Um, um, comments are due back on that on January 29th with reply in um, February, but then I was confused when it talked about the text to 911. Um, there were dates up there for March 11th with reply on um, in April. Are they all under the same thing? Is there another opportunity if we don't uh, aren't able to get them in by January 29th to still reply back to all of that in March, or are they two separate things, two separate um, um, periods? 
This is Lori Flaherty. I'm going to try and answer that on David's behalf, but we can certainly pass your question along to him. The, the first uh, notice of proposed rulemaking that he described was for texting uh, to 911, and it was with regard to requirements for the service providers for delivering those text messages to 911. Um, those are the what comments that are due later. Um, the, the second proceeding that he described was one it, that involved the bounce back message to the caller with regard to the availability of texting for 911, and that's the one that's on an accelerated uh, comment period. So that's the one that is, the comments are due next week, but uh, after January 29th, what will happen is uh, they also have what is called a reply period where if you look at the comments that have been made and you would like to make a reply to those comments, you can do so up until the second date, which I believe was in early February. So they're for two separate things, but the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the message to the caller with regard to the availability of texting to 911 was the one that was on an accelerated uh, comment period. Yeah, I think it's all part of the same thing. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters. Okay, this is Lori, and actually I have a question for uh, for Barry and Mark, going back to the, the consolidation uh, that you folks have been undergoing, with regard to the mandate in 2008, I'd just be curious to know what the genesis of that was. In other words, how did, you con how did, did public policy people become convinced uh, of the need to pass a law to do this? Um, I, I, were either of you around at that time? I'd just be curious to know sort of the background and how that actually was accomplished. And and as you've been going through that process, what has the role of the board been in terms of supporting the Peace Apps or providing resources? The origination of the consolidation requirement in the statute actually uh, came from the General Assembly when local government was asking for increased 911 fees and access to additional revenue to help run their Peace Apps lawmakers uh, began to look at uh, the number of PSAPs that were operating across the state and um, were asking the question, why do we have so many PSAPs when other states um, like Indiana um, do not have the same number? Maybe we need to consolidate uh, with new technology coming and save money and not pass the cost of that on to uh, the citizens and be a little more efficient in the services that is being offered. But during the session, they actually had added that to uh, the existing statute uh, to be a requirement. The um, board's role in that really did not uh, become um, – um, I guess the board didn't become involved until – uh, this past year when the legislation changed and gave the board uh, authority uh, over time one not just the wireless uh, spectrum. The uh, board is currently uh, looking at uh, the intent of the statute. Uh, it's vague in the areas as to what actually constitutes consolidation and with the change in uh, technology uh, statute was written to having the legacy model in mind and um, how does technology today change that landscape because it's not explicit in the statute uh, the board through their rulemaking authority will have to um, develop a, an instrument that counties can follow uh, to actually meet the intent of the statute and uh, the board can continue distributing the funding to those counties. Thank you. I have one more question if no one else has any others, and it's the question we, we always ask. Uh, now that you've done this and you know what you know, is there anything that you would have done differently 
as you've been putting this network and this system into place, either technically or operationally? Mark, I'll defer to you. I, I think, yeah, I'll just expand a little bit on Barry's last answer. There, the public safety had had several um, ac actions in previous legislative sessions to try to, I say, would say, res resolve the funding issue to a certain extent. And I think there was some institutional memory at the legislature that maybe less is more in this case, and that's another reason that that act came to be. But I think in terms of lessons that we've learned, um, it it is a very uh, interesting challenge. We started on the concept of using um, IP and advanced technologies uh, several years before Nina had developed the I3 standard. And I think, you know, you have to keep focused on the fact that 911 is a local service. Everything about what we've done, I think, at the state level, at the plan administration, at all, at all functions, really gets back to what is the best local service that we can provide, and how can you make it uniform across the state? And if you can stick to those goals and and live within that uh, that construct, I think anybody else could do what we've done very easily. Thank you. Uh, well, if there are no more questions. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Mark and Barry from Indiana and, and David, again, from the FCC um, for providing presentations. And thanks again to Lori and the National 9 program for uh, facilitating today's meeting. Um, we look forward to um, everyone's participation in future events, if we can get to the calendar. Um, our next installment will be Thursday, March 14th at noon Eastern with a presentation from Lori, again, in the National 9 Program update. Uh, registration from this event will open up in a little, a little over two weeks. Um, and then last slide, uh, again, for more information on the National 9 Program, please, please, visit, please visit our website at um, www.911.gov. Um, if you have any additional questions that we weren't able to get to today, um, contact information is there. It's ng911wg at bah.com, and we will forward your questions on. Um, again, thank you for attending. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.